Good morning and welcome to worship. Uh, we hope you are uh, at home safe and feeling well. We ask that you uh, continue to pray for our world and for our community in this time. Uh, I'm imagining you, uh, uh, you know, curled up at home and uh, uh, joining us and we can be together uh, in this way, even if we can't be together uh, physically. So thank you very much for being with us this morning. Uh, I've been inviting uh, each of you to find ways to make kind of a home worship space, a place of worship in your own home. Uh, so you might uh, find a candle that you could light at this time, and you can set aside this uh, time of worship by lighting a candle. And you also um, can find a bowl of water because we'll confess our sins at the beginning of worship. And when we do that, you can dip your finger in the water uh, to remember your baptism. And if you're feeling uh, really ambitious this morning, you can try and find a, a piece of purple cloth to remember the liturgical season of Lent, um, uh, kind of to keep the church here in that way as well. I, I wanna thank uh, those of you who have been helping to make phone calls uh, this past week. Um, I think those phone calls have been a, a nice way of keeping our community connected. And I hope that you'll Continue to reach out to one another, both through phone calls and emails, through Facebook, uh, through cards and letters. There are, are lots of ways that we can stay connected. Uh, thank you to our uh, to everyone who's making this worship possible. Uh, Wendy and, and uh, Anders have been doing a lot of work to record uh, the, uh, the music for today. And so I wanna thank them. And we're also trying something new today with a couple of worship assistants. We have uh, Annie Dean on the on the video today, and we have Dan Stout, Kaya Conrad, and Kristen Rice. So thank you to those people for helping with worship today. One of the things that we believe uh, is that uh, worship is something we do together. Uh, liturgy means the work of the people, which means it's the work of more than one person. It's the work of a whole community. It's something that we uh, do together when God gathers us together in God's presence. So welcome to worship this morning, and we'll begin with our confession and forgiveness. I invite you to find your bowl of water, and you can draw the sign of the cross on your forehead to remember your baptism. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who is present, who gives life, who calls into existence the things that do not exist. Amen. If you were to keep watch over sins, O Lord, who could stand? Yet with you is forgiveness, and so we confess. Please take a moment of silence for reflection and silent confession. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned away from you, knowingly and unknowingly. We have wandered from your resurrection life. We have strayed from your love for all people. Turn us back to you, O God. Give us new hearts and right spirits that we may find what is pleasing to you and dwell in your house forever. Amen. Receive good news. God turns to you in love. I will put my spirit in you and you shall live, says our God. All your sin is forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ, who is the free and abounding gift of God's grace for you. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with him. Let us pray. Almighty God, your son came into the world to free us all from sin and death. Breathe upon us the power of your spirit that we may be raised to new life in Christ 
and serve you in righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading today comes from Ezekiel chapter 37. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophecy to these bones, and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied, and I had been commanded, as I had been commanded, and as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, mortal, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. I prophesied as he had commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, Mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy and say to them, okay. Thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The second reading today comes from Romans chapter 8. To set the mind on the flesh is death, and to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. You are in the spirit since the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies, also through his Spirit that dwells in you. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The Gospel reading is from John, the 11th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill, so the sisters sent a message to Jesus. Lord, he whom you love is ill. When Jesus heard it, he said, This illness will not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, 
Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and you are going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, Lord fallen asleep, you will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought that he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I'm glad I was not there, that you may also believe. But let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us all go that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, you had been here. My brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, Already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Can I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, 
unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Christ. Grace and peace, friends, from God, who is our refuge, and from Jesus, who is the resurrection and the life. Amen. Whenever we read the scriptures, we expect something to happen. We expect God to work transformation in our lives whenever the word is proclaimed, is preached, is shared in Christian community. The purpose of the word, in a sense, is to help us see and experience the presence and activity of God now, in the present. The word of God is so much more than a book with old stories, although uh, beginning with the historical context is crucial for anyone who takes the Bible seriously. But more than that, the word of God contains a living word, a word that speaks to our present reality now. It's like our friends in the United Church of Christ say in their tagline, God is still speaking. That's one of our core convictions as people who, of faith, that God continues to speak into our world. You could think of it in this way. The scriptures act like a pair of glasses that bring God's present activity into clearer focus. The God that we meet in the witness of the Bible is the God we expect to meet in our life and in our world now. These convictions about God's ongoing activity in the world, however, can lead to some difficult questions. Perhaps the most difficult question for us today is where is God in all this? Where is God in the midst of a global pandemic? Where is God in unemployment? Where is God in isolation and loneliness? Where is God when the future is uncertain? I'd like to suggest that our gospel reading for today from the Gospel of John helps us to look for and discern God's activity in this time. One of the things that I love about this story is the way that it holds together both grief and resurrection. It's not one without the other. They're not separate. They seem to be held together as one in this story. For wondering where God is today, this story seems to suggest to us to look to those people and places that are grieving and to look for signs of resurrection. Likewise, Christian witness, the witness that you and I share, is one that holds together both grief and the promise of resurrection. Grief seems to be in the air today. David Kessler, who is one of the world's uh, foremost experts on grief gave an interview to the Harvard Business Review a few days ago. Kessler uh, worked with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who came up with the five stages of grief. Perhaps you've heard of those. There's uh, the first stage is denial, and then there's anger, and then bargaining, then sadness, and then finally acceptance. And Kubler-Ross believed that when we experience a loss, we seem to work through these five stages or work or experience these five stages at different points in our journey. And so Kessler worked with her and has uh, continued to uh, write about grief after her death. Uh, and he gave this interview where he described the grief uh, in the midst of this pandemic. And he says, we're feeling a number of different griefs. We feel the world has changed, and it has. We know this is temporary, but it doesn't feel that way. And we realize things will be different, just as going to the airport 
is forever different from how it was before 9-11. Things will change, and this is the point at which they changed. There's the loss of normalcy, the fear of economic toll, the loss of connection. This is hitting us, and we are grieving collectively. We are not used to this kind of collective grief in the air." End quote. Later on in the uh, uh, interview, Kessler will go on to talk about uh, how do we manage all this grief? How do we cope in the midst of this grief? And he says that understanding these five stages might be a place to start. And he says that uh, these stages aren't linear, even though we might want them to be, and they may not happen in the exact order, but uh, it might be helpful. He says, it's not a map, but the five stages provide some scaffolding for this unknown world. There's denial, which we say a lot of early on, things like this virus won't affect us. Then there's anger. You're making me stay home and taking away my activities. Then there's bargaining. Okay, if I social distance for two weeks, everything will be better, right? Then there's sadness. I don't know when this will end. And finally, there may be acceptance. This is happening. I have to figure out how to proceed. One of the things that I like about this, uh, these stages of grief is that it gives us a sense that this all takes time, this unknown world, and we can't rush it that grief hits us in unexpected ways and continues to evolve and change over time. In a similar way, our reading from gospel seems to have a variety of characters experiencing grief in different ways. There's a, a sense of denial at first when the disciples are confused about Jesus saying that Lazarus is asleep there's a sense of anger and bargaining in the voices of Mary and Martha. Martha, uh, If you had been here, Lord, our brother would not have died. There's a deep sense of sadness and confusion. You know, when the uh, people ask, uh, this man healed a blind man. Couldn't he have prevented this man, prevented his friend from dying? We see in these characters almost all the five stages of grief. And then eventually we reach what I think is one of the most powerful moments in all of Scripture. Our text says, Jesus began to weep. Jesus, even though uh, the Gospel of John tells us he is the Son of God, that he has this remarkable power and understanding of what the future of the world uh, is in God's dream, even in that, Jesus Jesus begins to weep. When I read this text, I hear my first kind of an answer to that question, where is God? Where is God now? Jesus is weeping alongside of us. If we want to look for where God is present and active now, look to those who are weeping. You know, I've been to uh, many funerals in my life. I've been involved in many funerals. And I remember a pastor in my past uh, uh, who was leading a funeral who said to the family um, that it's hard to know what to say on days like that. Words just don't seem to cut it. So he invited them to think of their tears as prayers. That their weeping was holy. That when we weep, we trust that Jesus is alongside us, that God is close to the brokenhearted. Likewise, in the letter to the Romans, Paul describes Christian community as rejoicing with those who rejoice and weeping with those who weep. If we're looking for God in this moment, if we are to be the people of God in this moment, we trust that Jesus meets us there in the grief in the weeping. And if we are part of the body of Christ in the world today, we must weep alongside the world as well. We need others to weep alongside us when we experience loss. Jesus began to weep. 
But this story also holds the mysterious promise of resurrection. And we need that word of hope too. In a way, resurrection allows us to grieve fully. Resurrection allows us to live with courage, to live with hope, because we know that death does not get the last word on us or on our world. If we are looking for signs of God's presence, we look for those places of grief, but we also look for the ways God will bring new life out of that grief. We need both. We need to weep with those who weep, and we need to rejoice with those who rejoice, and we need to look for signs of resurrection. Where is God in all of this? God is with you. Jesus weeps alongside us, and Jesus cries out, Lazarus, come out. Jesus says, unbind him and let him go. Amen. Turning our hearts to God, who is gracious and merciful, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. We pray especially for our congregation that you would hold us together and form new connections between us. Enliven the whole church with your spirit and bless the work of those who work for its renewal. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of life. You love the world you have made, and you grieve when creation suffers. Heal our world and protect the sick and vulnerable. Bring all things to new life. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of life, show redemption to all who watch and wait with eager expectation. Those longing for wars to cease. Those waiting for immigration paperwork to finalize those in healthcare and other essential functions, those who are unemployed, come quickly with your hope. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of life, you weep with those who grieve. Unbind all who are held captive by anxiety, despair, or pain, especially Todd, 
Bill, Joyce, Myron, Denia, Annie, Jen, Gordon, Joanne, Yvonne, Beverly, Jean, Penny, Chris, Judy, Bob, Larry, Kim, Darlene, Keith, James, Dick, and all for whom we will name now, aloud or silently. Fill us with compassion and empathy for those who struggle and keep us faithful in prayer. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of life, we give thanks for opportunities for this congregation to collaborate with others. Strengthen our ties in this time with other local congregations, agencies, and services. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of life, you are our resurrection. We remember all those who have died and trust that in you, they will live again. Breathe new life into our dry bones that we too might live with you forever. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. According to your steadfast love, O oh God, hear these and all our prayers as we commend them to you. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. On earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial. And deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours. Now and forever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Peace be 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 with you. I invite you today uh, to at some point, either right now during this service or later in the day, uh, to pick up your phone, to open your Facebook Messenger or your email, or sit down and write a card. Uh, send greetings of peace uh, to someone either in the Trinity family or someone in your life and simply say, peace be with you. It's usually at this point in the service or uh, that we would be, uh, the ushers would be in the back of the sanctuary gathering the offering plate and passing it around. Uh, the choir and others would be providing music during the offertory. Uh, but since we can't be together physically at this time, I invite you to think about other ways you can uh, make an offering as an act of worship. And in your bulletin this week, there's some information about electronic giving and also uh, a reminder that you can send checks to the church office. But if you go to our website, which is tlcmsn.org uh, backslash giving, uh, you can find a way to give online. So thank you all for your continued uh, support of Trinity's mission and ministry.
Now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. Holy God, speaking, spoken, inspiring, bless you, unbind you, and send you in love and in peace. Amen. Go in peace. Share the good news. Thanks be to God.